Alright guys, this chapter is going to be the respiratory system, chapter 22. So the respiratory system's main job is to achieve, well, two things. One is ventilation, which is the mechanical movement of air in and out of the lungs, and we'll talk more about that process in a bit. And the other is respiration. Now respiration is defined as um, a gas exchange across a membrane. It's a diffusion process. And so the gases we're concerned with here are um, oxygen and CO2 diffusing across the plasma membranes of epithelial uh, cells in the alveoli of the lungs, or the tissue spaces, and the capillaries. Some other functions of the respiratory system would include uh, temperature regulation, and um, down here mentions olfaction, your sense of smell, and of course voice production or speech. So, as I was mentioning, really the respiratory system is concerned with two main things. The mechanical movement of air, which we typically call breathing, um, and that really is pulmonary ventilation, the movement of air in and out of the lungs. And uh, that has an inhalation and an exhalation, which we'll be discussing shortly. And then this idea of respiration, gas exchange across a membrane. So, external respiration, uh, as the name implies, is gas exchange between the outside air and your pulmonary capillaries, the blood supply of the lungs. Well, that gas exchange doesn't happen out here, but it happens um, inside the lungs in what we call the alveolar spaces. So gas exchange between inhaled air and the pulmonary capillaries is called external respiration. Then we take that blood that's been oxygenated and we transport it to the tissue spaces, where then we have what's called internal respiration. And internal respiration is gas exchange between the systemic capillaries and um, the tissue spaces, the cells themselves. So we get oxygen going from those um, systemic capillaries into the um, tissue bed spaces. And then we get carbon dioxide coming out from the tissues into those capillaries. That's internal respiration. Alright, so we'll go over a picture of the, some of the major organs, which you'll be identifying in lab. We have a board that looks an awful lot like this. So the major players of the respiratory system are are split functionally into the, into what they do. And, and what's what's shown here is mostly something called the conducting zone. The conducting zone are apparati that are involved in, in ventilation, the movement of air into and out of the lungs. So we would start with the respiratory system up here with the external aperture of the nose, uh, which is called the nostril or nares, which there are left and right. And those feed into a tiny little opening uh, bounded by cartilages up here protruding from the anterior part of the face. Uh, that area inside we call that the vestibule. And then the air would travel through this uh, network of um, channels. The channels are called meatuses or meatuses. Those are the grooves here. And they're bounded by bony flesh covered projections called concha. And we've met those before. The inferior concha here is a projection of the maxilla and the middle and superior concha are projections of the ethmoid bone. Uh, those make up the walls, the lateral walls of the uh, nasal cavity. Now the meatuses and the concha together make up a structure called the turbinate. This is the nasal turbinate. And the function of the nasal turbinate is to kind of tumble the air, allow it to humidify, trap particles so that we can filter them out, and also uh, odorants are trapped up here in the olfactory epithelium on the superior nasal concha, and that's where we can activate our sense of smell. So after the air travels through the turbinate, it gets to this posterior region back here. Uh, this region is called the coana, um, or posterior vestibule, but usually just called the coana. And probably the most notable feature in the coana is this opening right there, which is the opening of the eustachian tube, or internal auditory tube, or uh, tympanopharyngeal uh, tube. Uh, that is the tube that leads up to the middle ear and equilibrates pressure between the middle ear and the outside environment. As we pass a little bit to the posterior of the coana, we enter into an area called the um, nasopharynx. So for now, guys, we'll just define the pharynx as a muscular tube, and there are three subregions to it, nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx, and we'll discuss those on a different slide a little bit later. The air passes through the pharynx, um, 
and then it it's, hits this peculiar area where the oral cavity, mostly full of the tongue here, crosses with the respiratory um, tract here. And that's an area called the oropharynx where those two actually cross. So when we breathe in or out, the air has to travel through the nasal and oropharynx and then pass into the laryngopharynx, which is a muscular pouch just immediately behind this structure. And that cartilaginous structure is called the larynx. Uh, you would know the larynx as the um, voice box. And this notable cartilage on the top is one that we introduced when we looked at the senses, uh, particularly the sense of taste, because it has a role to play in sensing the very bitter things. Uh, this is the epiglottis, the most superior cartilage of the larynx. Not involved in voice production, but does have an important job to fold down here when we swallow so that food passes through the oropharynx over the opening of the larynx and back into the esophagus posteriorly on its way to the stomach. Air, on the other hand, is to travel through the oropharynx and go anteriorly through the opening of the larynx called the glottis and travel into the larynx. So the larynx sits at the top of the trachea, which is this about 11, 12 inch tube um, bounded by about 30 different cartilage rings called C-ring or annular cartilages. These are hyaline cartilage rings, and that's actually what we looked at when we looked at hyaline cartilage in class. We looked at a uh, section of the trachea. We'll talk more about the function of the larynx. For now, we're just going to call it the voice box and realize that these two structures in here, kind of a superior ridge and an inferior ridge, are called the vocal fold, uh, the inferior one, and the vestibular fold, the superior one, and the inferior uh, vocal fold called the vocal cord or true vocal cord is used for sound production and the vestibular fold or the superior vocal fold is used um, just to help seal off the opening of the glottis during swallowing. So air travels through that down through the trachea. The base of the trachea down here is referred to the carina, referred to as the carina, a very heavy thick cartilage that can be seen on an x-ray radiogram. Then we split into the left and right bronchi, and the bronchi then split into secondary and tertiary bronchi, and then finally to bronchioles, which are the smallest passages for the air to travel through, until we get out into the lobes of the lung where we encounter the air sacs called alveoli. Uh, down to the bronchioles, that is all conducting zone. And the larynx is a boundary between what we call the upper and lower respiratory tract. So everything above the larynx is considered upper respiratory tract, and larynx down is considered lower respiratory tract. So as I mentioned, we can split the respiratory system into two functional zones. One is the respiratory zone, or respiratory zone. <coughs> and that, as the name implies, is where gas exchange actually takes place. And this starts at the level of something called a respiratory bronchial, the smallest bronchioles that really just have um, a minute amount of smooth muscle and mostly some thin epithelium where gas exchange can occur. Those respiratory bronchioles lead into alveolar ducts and alveoli, which we'll talk about on a slide a little bit later. And everything we've already talked about is the conducting zone, which, as the name implies, just is for ventilation, movement of air in and out of the lungs. Right. Well, what does the nose do? this nasal cavity. Go back to the slide here. So here's a close-up of our nasal cavity. So we have the nares out here and the vestibule. So the function of the nose and, I'm sorry, the vestibule is over here, and then the turbinate consisting of the concha and the meatuses. Um, well, these concha are bony protrusions, but they're covered with um, uh, pseudo-stratified ciliated columnar epithelium and uh, they secrete mucus or a mucous membrane and their functions are related to those different tissue types. The mucus traps inhaled material uh, both things that we want to smell and things that we want to filter out. The cilia have the property of beating what's called retrograde. They beat backwards and sweep the material back here to the oropharynx, nasal and oro oropharynx, where really we can swallow it down into the stomach and essentially destroy anything that might be harmful in there in the acid pit environment of the stomach. Being a turbinate, that lends itself, that name lends itself to the other function here, 
and that is that when the air is inhaled in a laminar fashion, we want to disrupt that flow and make it become turbulent. And we know from what we talked about in hemodynamics, turbulent flow is both noisy and slow, and so we can hear it, but that's inconsequential. But the slowness is what we're interested in. We want to slow up the flow so that particles trapped in that inhaled air have a chance to, to settle out in this mucus and get trapped, partly so we can smell them and so that we can filter them out if they're, if they're dangerous. And also, um, the air in the respiratory tract is very, very humid, and it's very rarely um, that humid outside. So when we breathe that air in, the turbinate slows it down and actually adds moisture to the air to humidify it, and that helps prevent drying out of the alveoli and the respiratory membrane within the lungs. So don't worry about the different cartilages of the nose. I suppose I'd like you to know that the septum up here is um, uh, mostly hyaline cartilage, and the cartilages that bound the nares down here are elastic cartilage, and then there's a fibrocartilage at its base. But really, just know that alar, A-L-A-R, means the cartilages of the nose. discussed everything there. The great trivia question is, what is the name of this thing right down here? It's called the philtrum, that little ridge you see extending between the lip and the nose. So I mentioned that those meatuses are covered with an epithelium. Well, you know the superior part on the superior nasal concha is called olfactory epithelium, and that's where humans have your 100,000 or so olfactory receptors. Um, the, respiratory, the, the rest of the respiratory mucosa is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, mucous membrane, uh, which helps trap material. Also in that mucus we secrete some chemicals, I think I may mention this in AMP1, uh, lysozyme is a chemical that breaks down carbohydrates, so it's effective at destroying many gram-positive bacteria. And defensins are um, uh, a type of uh, antimicrobial protein that's also found in um, uh, mucus. Here's a sagittal section of a cadaver head. So you can see here are the concha superior, middle, and inferior, with the meatuses in between. There's the opening of the eustachian tube in the coana. Um, the floor of the nasal cavity is actually the hard palate of the oral cavity, and uh, that's the palatine bone right there. The roof of the nasal cavity is uh, frontal bone, ethmoid bone, and sphenoid bone posteriorly. And the lateral walls are, of course, the maxilla. Okay, we mentioned the concha and the meatuses together make up the turbinate, and there it lists for you the uh, functional aspects of the uh, turbinate that we already mentioned. The perinasal sinuses, which we learned back when we learned the bones, which we know are sphenoidal, ethmoid, and maxillary, um, they have a couple functions. One, they lighten the the bone load of the skull, so they make the skull lighter, and then they also act as resonating chambers for speech. They secrete mucus, and then they may lend themselves to humidifying and warming the air as well. I mentioned that the larynx is the division line between upper and lower respiratory tract, so we can talk about the different infections and inflammations that you can have. If you have an infection in the nasal cavity, it's called the it's called rhinitis. If it's in the perinasal sinuses, then that would be sinusitis. If it's in the nasopharynx, it's called pharyngitis. Um, if it's in the um, larynx itself, then it would be called laryngitis. That would be a lower respiratory tract infection, as would be bronchitis or pneumonia. Those would be lower respiratory tract infections. All right, the pharynx. Let's take a look at that. So the pharynx is the muscular tube that connects the nasal cavity down to the esophagus. And it has three parts, and there you can see in red we're highlighting the nasopharynx, 
in blue we're highlighting the oropharynx and in green the laryngopharynx so these are just the conducting tubes to go from the nasal passage down to the esophagus which obviously is not what food should do food should go through the oropharynx and down through the laryngopharynx and into the esophagus air on the other hand when inspired goes through the nasopharynx oropharynx and then just briefly in the laryngopharynx as it travels into the trachea anteriorly I'll talk about the tonsils a little bit later here's a good picture so in the pharynx we have the tonsils and tonsils are an example of something called diffuse um, uh, lymphoid tissue and we'll talk about the function of lymphoid tissue when we talk about the lymphatic system and immunity but for now let's just say that it's a spot where your immune system samples antigens incoming foreign material and can activate and mature lymphocytes in these tissues so you have three um, tonsils to be aware of in the posterior of the oropharynx uh, nasopharynx you have the pardon me you have the pharyngeal tonsils here which are also called the adenoids and they may extend actually well down into the oropharynx in some individuals and then you have what are called the uh, palatine tonsils palatine tonsils and those are on the lateral walls of the oropharynx this area the opening of the oropharynx is sometimes called the isthmus of the fosses but that's unwieldy to say so I just usually call it the oropharynx and that's where you have like I said on the lateral walls you have these um, palatine tonsils and if you open your mouth and stick the tongue out and say ah it is the palatine tonsils that the doctor is observing at the base of the tongue but something that would require a, a, a scope to be able to see is, um, is the lingual tonsil and that's at the base of the tongue just superior to the epiglottis All right, so the larynx. Well, as I said, the larynx we know we typically call the voice box. And it says here provides a patent airway, an open airway. Let's take a look at this. Some pictures. In lab, we have a figure that looks almost identical to this. All right, and it consists of um, several cartilages, the most superior of which here is the epiglottis. This is an anterior view. Um, our mandible would be right up here. This deep bone is that hyoid bone that anchors a lot of the muscles used for uh, swallowing. So you have the epiglottis up at the top, and that folds back to close the opening of the larynx when you swallow. The most anterior of the cartilages is called the thyroid cartilage, and it has this large anterior tipped projection called the laryngeal prominence and that's what we would know as our Adam's apple which is present present in both males and females but it's much more anteriorly tipped in males so we tend to see it more prominently in males and incidentally that's also what accounts for a male's deeper voice the base of the larynx is called the cricoid cartilage which looks a little small and kind of diminutive here in the front but as we wrap around we'll see it's actually quite large in the back it's circular and goes all the way around so the uh, cricoid cartilage is considered to be the base of the larynx there are ligamentous uh, connections between all of the bones and cartilages some of them are worth noting this guy right here is called the cricothyroid ligament Usually I see that written cricothyroidal ligament, but cricothyroid ligament. And that goes between the cricoid and the thyroid cartilages. And up here we actually have the thyrohyoidal membrane. These are two places that in surgical incisions you could actually cut into the larynx and insert a breathing tube if necessary. Uh, the uh, cricothyroidal ligament would be the favored target. And that would be called a, a, a cric tube that you put in there. Um, cricothyroidectomy or cricothyroidotomy. Uh, a cric tube is where you would put a tube in there and, uh, and you would bypass all of this material and you could still ventilate. Uh, you'll see individuals that have surgery on their larynx or obstructions in their uh, airways could potentially have a cric tube put in in that area. If we look at it I think from the lateral point of view will be next here. I think. There we go. 
Looking at it from the lateral point of view here, to the uh, right is the anterior thyroid cartilage tipping forward. There's the cricoid cartilage, the base. You see it's narrow in the front and broad in the back. Sitting on the cricoid cartilage, cartilage are two smaller, kind of funny-shaped cartilages. The one that's shaped like a, um, I was going to say like a, a hook or something. Here, this is called the arytenoid cartilage, and it actually is the anchor point uh, for the vocal folds the false vocal fold and the true vocal fold. The lower one is the true vocal cord or vocal fold and the higher one is called the vestibular fold or false vocal fold. Only the true vocal cord functions in normal speech production. The vestibular fold, the superior one, is actually a lot fleshier than the lower one. and has a, a fleshier mound around it and when you um, swallow these two fleshy mounds come together in the middle of the uh, larynx and make a seal that then the epiglottis folds down and sits on and so the vestibular fold and the epiglottis together keep food from being aspirated or brought down into the trachea. As air passes over the vocal fold it makes it vibrate and that's what accounts for the different tones that we can produce. And I'm no singer but um, you get the idea when this um, is pulled a little tighter um, you get higher pitches, and when it's more relaxed, you get lower pitches. So that accounts for things like the la or la. Those are the two different sounds. And the deeper sounds you can get are the result of this uh, thyroid cartilage being tipped forward and actually elongating this, and that makes for a deeper uh, tone that can be gained. The musculature uh, that's not really pictured here, here they show the arytenoid muscles. There are several muscles that attach to the retinoid cartilage that change the tension on these vocal cords, and that's actually how you change the pitches of your, of your um, speech. At the tip of the retinoid cartilage is the corniculate cartilage, and that's just a hook that's connected to some of the musculatures. So you've got the corniculate here, this little guy at the top, and the much larger retinoid cartilage below. And then buried in the wall, the lateral wall of the larynx, is, an, is the last cartilage called the cuneiform cartilage. And it's really just a structural reinforcement of the wall of the trachea. It doesn't have a functional role to play in voice production. So your cartilages are the base, cricoid cartilage, the anterior, thyroid cartilage, the top, the epiglottis, the cartilages involved in voice production, which are the tiny little corniculate and the much larger arytenoid and then the lateral reinforcing cuneiform cartilages. And you can find all of those on the model that we have in the lab except the cuneiform cartilage. That one really can't be viewed on the model. There's one spot in the posterior where there's a little painted dot that kind of represents it, but other than that there's, there's nothing visible. Here's a dissected trachea showing you the same thing, so you can look at that. I'm not going to talk about that one. Again, this is a dissected trachea, but still in the context of the neck, and we can see the carotid artery and the jugular veins over here. This is the glottis, and this is the epiglottis above it. That would be the base of the tongue right there. So as I mentioned, the uh, vocal ligaments, the vestibular and um, true vocal cords are attached to the arytenoid and corniculate cartilages. Ordinarily only the true vocal cord is um, the one that is used in voice production. And I say ordinarily because there are times where people can actually train themselves to, to, to use the vestibular fold to produce a very weird, deep, resonating type of sound, but that's unusual. And here's a picture of the glottis open with the vestibular fold there and then the true vocal fold exposed below. And here's an example of it more closed with the vestibular fold now closed in and the true vocal cords pinched shut. So nothing more to add here. I already talked about how speech is produced. So as we mentioned, something uh, worth elaborating on here. The vocal folds can close, and when they close, they essentially trap air in the rest of the conducting zone um, in something called a valsalva's maneuver. 
you can close the glottis, uh, trapping the air in the um, thorax and actually giving the abdominal muscles a base on which to contract. Um, this is used when you want to produce a lot of intra-abdominal pressure, as it says here, when you're trying to empty the rectum or during heavy lifting. This is part of why you hold your breath. It's kind of a natural thing to do when lifting. Now, you have to train yourself to breathe out and kind of resist this when you're when you say lifting weights because it can actually make you pass out. Okay, onto the trachea. What do I want to tell you about the trachea? So the trachea here is shown in cross section with the at the bottom being anterior has um, three basic layers. It has an epithelial layer, which is a mucosa. It has a submucosal connective tissue layer, which contains many seromucosal glands that are kind of shown in purple here. And then it has a hyaline cartilage base to it. These are the annular or C-ring cartilages. Now, it's important to note that the cartilages do not totally enclose the trachea. They're not circular. They're only about um, maybe 60 to 70 percent enclosed. The back is open and flexible, and it's covered by a muscle called the trachealis muscle. And that's important because butted up against the trachea and the posterior, butted up against it, is um, this structure here, which is the esophagus, which we use when we swallow. Now, the esophagus is usually collapsed flat, but when you swallow, a bolus of food passes through here and stretches this. And if that cartilage ring went all the way around, it would put a lot of pressure on the trachea, and it would make it hard to swallow, and it'd be very, very painful. In fact, if you've ever taken too big of a bite and swallowed a, a, a larger than normal bolus of food, you will have stretched this and you'll have encountered that pain. Um, and it hurts like crazy. Well, here's a histology section of the trachea, and we'll have a chance to look at this in lab again. Uh, perhaps we'll remember that this was our example of pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium we see up here. And there's the cilia. These cilia beat um, anterograde rather than like the cilia that are in the nasopharynx, pardon me, which beat retrograde and bring the food back into the oropharynx. Not food, but any, any material trapped in the, in the mucosa. Uh, back to the oropharynx for swallowing. These beat the other direction. These beat forward and take the food or any material that's trapped in the trachea, which is not where you should have food ordinarily, take it up through um, away from the, the respiratory zone and the, the conducting zone of the lower respiratory tract and sweep it up to the oropharynx again so we can swallow it down into the stomach and destroy it. The epithelium, like always, sits on a basement membrane and a lamina propria. This little bit of connective tissue, and then beneath that, we find some cuboidal epithelium arranged in either stratified or simple layers which make up our seromucosal glands and that's what we're looking at right here and we go down below that and we'll find a perichondrium and then hyaline cartilage there's an electron micrograph showing you the tufts of cilia a little interesting side note guys these ciliated epithelial cells are the cells that are targeted for infection by the influenza virus that's how they gain entry into your body, and it's those cells that they initially attack and destroy. Okay, so remember, we're still marching our way through the conducting zone, so now we're traveling down through the trachea, um, down our 20 or so C-ring cartilages till we get to the bronchi. And the bronchi are just the initial right and left branches, and then they go through what are called... Um, secondary and tertiary branches, and then we get to levels of um, branching called bronchioles. Let's talk about that now. Let's see if we get to a picture. Alright, so the way this works, so the air passes through the larynx up here, right, comes down through the trachea, this is the carina. Let's put a C-A-R right there. That's the carina. And then we go off to the left and to the right. Um, we know if 
when we're looking at this, we're not sure. See, there's a notch right here, which is distinct to this side. This is called a cardiac notch, and that's where the apex of the heart actually nestles, just a little bit to the left of the sternal border. So that actually does make the left lung ever so slightly smaller than the right lung. And that's kind of reflected in the fact that the left lung only has two lobes. It has a superior lobe here and an inferior lobe there, and it's separated by something called the oblique fissure. Right. Well, the left primary bronchus then goes off this direction, and it splits into what are called secondary bronchi, which there's one here and one here. The secondary bronchi are also called lobar bronchi. Okay. And then the secondary bronchi branch into tertiary bronchi. And that would be here, and here, and here, and here. Those tertiary are also called segmental bronchi. And that same thing is reflected on the right, where we have one, two, and three secondary bronchi, or lobar bronchi, and you'll notice on the right that we have a superior, middle, and inferior lobe to the lung. And the superior and middle lobe is are separated by something we call the horizontal fissure, and the middle and inferior are separated from each other by something we call the oblique fissure. Right? So our bronchi, of which on the right side we have three lobes, so we have three lobar or secondary bronchi, and then they become the tertiary bronchi down here. So those are your tertiary bronchi. Then we go through about 21 more levels of branching until we get down to the most distal levels in these areas where we have the bronchioles. Well, actually most of those 22 levels of branching are bronchioles where we get down to a level called respiratory bronchioles, and I'll show that in just a second. Let's erase all of this stuff here. Well, I'd like to. Otherwise, my pictures will be all messed up later. Mm, good enough. So everything that we've talked about now up to this point would be the conducting zone. That's just about mechanical ventilation, moving air in and out of the lungs. When we get to those tiny little spots I just erased, erased that's going to be the respiratory bronchioles, and that is the beginning of the respiratory zone, as the name would kind of imply. Huh. So near the end of the um, conducting zone, we slowly but surely give give way to our cartilage rings, which still remain associated with all the bronchioles. Then we get down to the lowest ones, where really we just have smooth muscle associated with the walls, and that allows for what we call bronchoconstriction um, and or bronchodilation, and that is a way of regulating the airflow into and out of the alveolar spaces. All right, so let's get to the respiratory zone. And we do have a model a little bit like this in lab. It's it's uh, horizontal, it's uh, vertical instead of horizontal like this. But it starts with these structures right here called terminal bronchioles. And so bronchioles are just passages of the airway that are less than one millimeter in diameter. That's how they're defined. The terminal bronchiole is the last branch of the bronchial network that doesn't conduct any respiration. Um, it doesn't do the process of respiration. Now you'll see there's still smooth muscle. Now, to my understanding, most of the research I've done indicates that terminal bronchioles don't have any cartilage plates associated with them either. So if you still see some cartilage wrapped around it, it's not a terminal bronchiole. Once it's just smooth muscle, then you could call it a terminal bronchiole. The distinction between a terminal bronchiole and a respiratory bronchiole are the presence of these little sacs out here. These little sacs are called alveoli, singular alveolus. Um, once we have those associated with a bronchiole, then we call it a respiratory bronchiole. And a respiratory bronchiole is the beginning of the respiratory um, zone. Once the smooth muscle goes away, it's no longer a bronchiole. 
Um, so here we can see there's a little band of smooth muscle. Now here it's gone. At this point we would call that an alveolar duct, where several of the alveoli are fused, but we still have the kind of the conducting pathway. But gas exchange is occurring here. So respiratory bronchial there, alveolar duct here, and then finally the alveolar ducts end in a collection of all of these fused alveoli, like a common room or something like that. And this is called an alveolar sac. And you can see here shown in the context of the larger lung. This is a histology slide with a drawing to the right showing you the, the connection. So as we had a respiratory bronchial coming down here, it gave way to an alveolar duct. And that's what we're seeing here with these pouches of fused alveoli. And then finally, that gives rise to a collection of a dozen or so uh, fused alveoli in a bulbous structure, and that's called an alveolar sac. So the sac is the end. Now this is like a cul-de-sac street. It's a blind end. So as the air comes into the alveolar sac, it swirls around in here, gas exchange occurs, and then that air has to go back out the way it came in. It's not a continuous flow circuit. You can see we have these tiny little connecting pores between the alveoli that allow air to travel between them. All right, so here's the drawing. Then we look over here, and we can see we still have some muscle attached here. This is a respiratory bronchial. No cartilage plates, so it's not a terminal bronchial or a, a one of the higher orders of bronchioles. And then once we get to this area, that smooth muscle is gone. It's just alveoli. So this is a duct. This is an alveolar duct, and you can see how that would be a channel that travels through here, right? This is a duct. In fact, it branches down there. And another one up here. Okay, so that's a duct. And then these ducts will eventually end in a sac. And they don't really, they show you a sac down here, but we could just as easily call this a sac, or that a sac. They show one here. Kind of do an artist's rendering of what's going on there. That's a sac. Presumably these sacs are connected to a duct, so the air travels this way. Down a duct, finds its way eventually to a sac. Okay. Where it would swirl around and then go back out. So in it comes during inhalation and swirls around, gas exchange occurs, external respiration would be occurring here and then goes back out for expiration. Alright, now here's a big blow up showing that same type of structure and we're going to talk about some of the cellular events that happen here. Oop, lost my pointer, where'd it go? There it is. Okay. So what do we have up here? Here's a uh, terminal bronchial, and then giving rise to about here a respiratory bronchial. And we know that's a respiratory bronchial because of the presence of this guy, because we have an alveolus attached to it. And that's really what makes a respiratory bronchial different than a terminal bronchial. And then the respiratory bronchial is eventually going to give rise to something like this, which is a duct, an alveolar duct. And those are going to terminate in this structure out here, which is a sac. Now they're showing you a few other things here. They're showing you the blood supply. Now here we have to remember that blood would be coming in on this blue guy. So that blue blood vessel would be what? What is that guy? All right, if you said a branch of the pulmonary artery, you are correct. That is the pulmonary artery, which is currently deoxygenated blood coming from the heart. We take that in until we get down to the pulmonary capillaries, and you'll see this is where the blood is transitioning from blue to red, because that's where oxygenation is occurring. The oxygen that we have just brought in through inhalation is now traveling via external respiration from the alveolar spaces into these capillaries and oxygenating it, and then it is brought out on this vessel, which would be the pulmonary, what? Pulmonary vein. Okay, so how we go on the pulmonary vein, oxygenated back to the left atrium of the heart for dissemination around the body. So now we're going to spend some time talking about what happens right here, in what's called the respiratory membrane. The air comes into these alveoli. Now there are two types of cells that make up these alveoli, and I'll talk about those in just a minute. Type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes. Only type 1 pneumocytes, the squamous guys, are the ones that do respiration. The type 2 pneumocytes, uh, they secrete surfactant which is a, like a detergent that helps lower the surface tension so these alveoli can remain open. 
There's an electron micrograph showing you the alveoli and the capillaries that surround them. I find this to be a pretty startling number right here. Two million dead macrophages per hour carried by the cilia out to the throat and swallowed uh, in what's called the mucociliary escalator. That's what's constantly sweeping trapped material in the uh, mucous membranes up to the oropharynx for destruction. Uh, I don't you know, two million cells is not a large volume of cells, but that's a lot of cells. All right, here's a blow up of the alveolus. Okay, and I think I mentioned to you these cells here are the squamous guys. We know what a simple squamous epithelial cell is. In fact, this is one of the slides we looked at when we identified that tissue type in lab. So those are our uh, type one pneumocytes. Here we go type 1, it says type 1 alveolar cell, usually these are called pneumocytes. I need to get a pair, so let me do this better. Okay, so those are type 1 pneumocytes, and type 1 pneumocytes are the squamous pneumocytes. They're the ones that do external respiration, gas exchange. So oxygen would be going through this pneumocyte into this capillary and being carried by the hemoglobin and the red blood cells. Carbon dioxide, conversely, would be going from the blood and the red blood cell through the epithelium of the capillary, through the epithelium of the alveolus, and then out here into the space. So this is where respiration is occurring. External respiration is occurring across there. Then, uh, let's see here, what do we have? We have these blue guys blue guys are macrophages and it's their job to scour around in the alveoli and find foreign material like viruses and dust particles and bacteria and fungal spores that don't belong there and engulf them by phagocytosis and then crawl back out into the terminal bronchi uh, I and um, hold on just a moment well where were we I think we were talking about these blue cells right here which are macrophages so I got cut off there and interrupted. Um, macrophages, also in the alveoli, these are called dust cells. They wander around in here and they phagocytize foreign material and then they crawl back out through the ducts and into the respiratory bronchioles and terminal bronchioles where they get trapped in cilia and then are swept up in the mucociliary escalator to the oropharynx where they're swallowed down into the stomach and destroyed. And so that's their job to scour these alveoli for foreign material. And finally, that leaves us with these guys that are in green here. Um, pardon me. And they are known as type 2 uh, or great uh, pneumocytes, type 2 alveolar cells uh, or type 2 pneumocytes, also called great pneumocytes. And their job is to manufacture a uh, chemical called surfactant. And the surfactant is secreted out out of this epithelial layer to reduce the surface tension. It works like a detergent uh, to kind of break down the adhering properties of the fluid film in here so that these alveoli will remain open. What you can't really see in this drawing, but we did in a previous slide, let me get back up to that here. Yeah, There's elastic fiber around the outside of these alveoli, and that elastic fiber will allow the alveoli to remain sprung open partially, provided that there isn't so much, so much surface tension on the inside that it makes them collapse. So that's the interplay. The surface tension is broken by the surfactant released by the type 2 pneumocytes and then the elastic fiber allows the alveoli to remain open. All right, the position of the lungs. Let's go to a picture where we can see the position of the lungs. Um, this is more laboratory material. Uh, the lungs extend up just past the clavicle superiorly and all the way down to the diaphragm inferiorly. The base of the lungs sits on the diaphragm and the apex of the lungs, the cone-shaped apex, sits just beneath the clavicle. Uh, they're lateral to the uh, mediastinum, and um, they each contain their own membrane-bound compartment, or they're both contained within their uh, membrane-bound compartment called the pleural cavity. And if we look up here at this call-out, we'll see, well, there's the rib, and then these are the intercostal muscles, and then here we have uh, the parietal pleural membrane, the pleural cavity, which would be filled with serous fluid, and we have the visceral pleural membrane. And the fact that there's a little bit of fluid in here is somewhat important because just like a wet suction cup can stick to glass, 
Um, as long as this is a little damp, there will be some natural suction in this pleural cavity that helps keep the lungs stuck to the parietal pleural layer, which is actually on the inside of the thoracic cavity. And that's going to be important later uh, when we expand the thorax due to this uh, suction, uh, suction action in here. It expands the lungs as well. The lateral surfaces of the lungs are, of course, up against the chest wall. And the medial surface of the lungs, uh, with their parietal pleural membrane, actually makes the boundary of the mediastinum in the middle. And the lower two-thirds of the mediastinum is filled up with the pericardial cavity. And the upper one-third uh, is just a mediastinum that contains things like the thymus, the great blood vessels, esophagus, and trachea. You'll notice that the left lung is slightly smaller than the right lung. The left lung consists of two lobes, an upper lobe and a lower lobe, separated by the uh, what's called the oblique fissure. And the right lung has three lobes, uh, superior separated from the middle uh, lobe by the horizontal fissure, which is only going to be on the right side. And then the middle lobe separated from the inferior lobe by another oblique fissure. The base of the lungs fits and sits nicely down on the diaphragm, and the apex is up here. And when the lungs fill, consequently, the lungs fill uh, from the base to the apex. Here's an actual picture of a lung looking at it from the mediastinal surface, so we're looking as if we're in the middle looking out laterally. There's an indentation on the uh, medial aspect of the lung called the hilum, and that's what we're highlighting here. It's an indentation. We'll see that term recycled again when we talk about the kidney. The indentation on the kidney is also called the hilum. The hilum is where the bronchi enter and the pulmonary, sorry, pulmonary artery enters and the pulmonary veins exit. Here's a casting of the bronchial tree. So here we're seeing the lower trachea, the carina right here, um, the uh, left bronchus and its two lobar bronchi or secondary bronchi, and the right bronchus and its one, two, three tertiary bronchi. And then these are the bronchial networks that go all the way down to the alveoli. Okay, it's probably the tenth time we've mentioned this. For pulmonary circulation, the pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle of the heart to the lungs to get oxygenated. The pulmonary veins then collect the oxygenated blood up, deliver it back to the left atrium of the heart, where it then goes into the left ventricle for dissemination around the body. We'll talk more about ACE, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme, when we talk about renal function. I'm not going to say much about that now. Kind of needless to say, between the pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary veins are the pulmonary capillaries, which actually are what are involved in the respiratory membrane and do gas exchange with the alveoli. Now, the lung tissue itself, the connective tissues of the lung and the epithelium and the blood vessels and the bronchi, uh, they can't get oxygen from the um, oxygen that is flowing. I'm sorry, from the air that is flowing in and out of the lungs. Uh, they need their own blood supply to supply that active metabolic tissue with glucose and oxygen. And so, the blood supply to the lung tissue is called uh, or, or is supplied by the bronchial arteries. So, in this case, these are arteries that go to the lungs, much much smaller than the pulmonary arteries they go to the lungs to deliver oxygenated um, blood to the lung tissue. And likewise, the bronchial veins would then take deoxygenated blood back from the veins. Now, there's a little point here. Bronchial veins and anastomose with the pulmonary veins. All right, let that, think in, let that sink in for a minute. Bronchial veins are carrying deoxygenated blood from the lung tissue. Uh, the structural components of the lung, while the pulmonary veins are taking blood from the alveoli. Now the pulmonary veins are the ones that contain oxygenated blood. The bronchial veins are deoxygenated. So as a result, we're basically mixing deoxygenated blood from the bronchial veins with oxygenated blood from the pulmonary veins. That lowers the oxygenation capability of the pulmonary uh, blood just a little bit. But when we talk about this a little bit later, we'll see that that really doesn't affect the oxygenation uh, or hemoglobin carrying capacity of oxygen.
Let's see, anything else we leave out? That's yeah, all just structural material. Yeah. Okay, so as we mentioned, ventilation is the mechanical movement of air in and out of the lungs. Right. Ventilation is dependent solely on pressure gradients. So if you could just open up your respiratory tract and kind of let your jaw hang slack, um, the pressure in your lungs would equilibrate with the atmospheric pressure, and at which point we would call that zero. We'd give that equilibrated pressure a pressure of zero. Now it's obviously not actually a zero atmosphere or zero psi type pressure. It's a relative pressure, meaning that the pressure in the lungs is currently equilibrated with the outside pressure. So again, we would call that the zero point. Now relative to that equilibrated pressure, we're going to talk about changes. When we breathe in, what happens here is we expand the thorax and that drops the pressure in the thorax due to the relationship of Boyle's law and then air flows in from a higher pressure outside to a lower pressure inside. When we breathe out we collapse the thorax, decrease the volume, the pressure goes up and now air flows out. This is called the uh, intrapleural or intrapulmonary pressure and it oscillates between negative one and one millimeter of mercury. We'll show a picture of that in a second. So that intrapulmonary, also called alveolar pressure or intraalveolar pressure, oscillates between one and negative one. When it's one, it's higher than outside pressure and we breathe out. When it's negative one, it's lower than outside pressure and we breathe in. Now that's different than intrapleural pressure. Intrapleural pressure is the pressure present in the pleural cavity. And if you remember, the pleural cavity is that tiny little space between the parietal and visceral pleural membranes surrounding each lung. Interestingly, this pressure must always remain slightly negative. So again, to reiterate that, intrapleural, that means the pressure in the pleural cavity. And the pleural cavity is that space between the parietal and visceral pleural membranes. It's a tiny little fluid-filled space. Remember how I mentioned that we can kind of think of the moisture in there as being important because uh, it functions sort of like when you lick a suction cup and stick it to a piece of glass or something. You press it down and the elastic recoil creates a low pressure area between the glass and the, and the um, suction cup. And that's actually, what, that's actually what makes the suction cup stay stuck to the wall. In the same way, elastic recoil of the lungs is trying to pull the lung tissue in from the thoracic wall. But there's fluid pressure in that in that um, pleural space and much like that suction cup it it keeps the uh, lung, the surface of the lung covered with the visceral pleura kinda stuck up against the thoracic wall not not directly on it but just a little gap there that gap just like you would have in a suction cup pulling away from the wall creates a negative pressure and that's actually what keeps the lungs inflated if we lost that negative pressure, well, just like the suction cup falling off the wall, the lungs would elastically recoil and they would collapse into a mass like a pile of wet tissue paper. So here's the most important money line. The intrapleural pressure must always stay negative. As a result of it staying negative, the lungs will always stay slightly inflated. If we lose that negative pressure or in a worse condition, we introduce positive pressure into the pleural cavity, the lungs will collapse. And so this slide gets at what I was talking about, these two opposing forces. The chest wall is constantly trying to be expanded, whether you call that the elastic force or actually the act of muscular action. We're trying to expand the chest wall. Meanwhile, the lungs and their elastic tissue are trying to recoil. And just like making that wet suction cup and pushing it up against the glass and it tries to recoil, that creates a low pressure area. That's what creates the negative IP. When we expand the chest even more during inhalation, that negative pressure increases. It's like having a, a stronger suction cup pulling. It makes a lower negative pressure. So while the intrapleural pressure always stays negative, during inhalation it becomes more negative, and during exhalation it becomes less negative. But again, always staying negative. And let's make sure we contrast that to intraalveolar pressure which oscillates between positive during exhalation and negative during inhalation. And we have a graph that shows this here. The difference between those two pressures, if you took the pulmonary pressure, that's the intraalveolar pressure, and you subtracted the um, intrapleural pressure from that, you'd get a concept called the transpulmonary pressure. 
the transpulmonary pressure becomes greater during inhalation, and that's really the significance of that, of that figure. Right. Now here are a few diagrams outlining this for you. So our conducting zone brings the air down into the lungs. <coughs> so this figure here is trying to represent the alveolar pressure or intrapulmonary pressure, and currently it's zero, so we're not breathing in or breathing out. And you notice, at this time, the intra Pleural pressure is currently negative 4, so it's always negative, and the lungs are nice and inflated at this point. They're not super inflated, hyperinflated like they would be after a maximal breath. They're just ready to bring in more air, but they're not collapsed. Hmm, I was pretty sure we were going to get another picture here. Just a second. I'll come back to that in just a minute. Yeah, okay, so now they take this time to introduce Boyle's Law. Here's Boyle's Law as I teach it in chemistry. Um, Boyle's Law, and it's not a minus sign here, that's just a bullet point. It's basically, it says that there's a uh, indirect relationship between the pressure of a gas and the volume of the gas, such that if the pressure increases, so that would be, we go from P1 to P2, the pressure is increasing, the volume would drop. Or functionally the way it works in human breathing, we change the volume and we adjust the pressure. So here's how it works in human breathing. If I'm sitting here at rest, like we're showing in this picture right here, okay, my lungs might currently have a volume of, let's say, 5 liters, which is, an, which is a realistic number. Okay. Now, I go ahead and inhale. Well, we know when we inhale that our chest, if you just do it, you'll feel it, the chest wall expands. Um, if it's quiet inhalation, then really it's just a diaphragm, but if you put a little bit more effort into it, you expand the chest wall. Okay. As a result, the volume of the lungs increases. Well, what does Boyle's Law tell us will happen? If we expand the thorax, go from V1 to V2, in order for this expression to remain fixed, the pressure must fall. Okay. If V goes up, P has to go down to keep the volume of this expression the same. And that's exactly what happens when we expand the thorax. The pressure in the intrapleural um, area drops. It becomes negative, right? Our, our alveolar pressure drops to negative 1, and we breathe in. When we turn this around and we exhale, we compress the thorax, and the volume goes down. If the volume goes down, the pressure must go up. And as a result, the pressure, the intrapleural pressure, goes up and now air flows out. And that's how Boyle's Law governs human breathing. The fact that we expand the chest to create a low pressure area inside the uh, alveoli to let air flow in along this gradient makes this process called um, negative pressure breathing. We create a relatively negative pressure in the alveoli to breathe in. And here's where students frequently get the cart before the horse. Okay. They'll tell me things like, we blow air into the lungs, or we suck air into the lungs, and that makes the lungs expand, and that's completely backwards. We expand the chest, and that creates a low pressure area, and now air flows in passively. Okay, so let me back up and catch this point. We see here that we have a negative intra-pleural uh, pressure, and that keeps the lungs expanded. Well. The next slide here refers to lung collapse. Well, the fancy name for lung collapse is atelectasis. That's what this word is here, atelectasis. That's lung collapse. And the most likely cause of lung collapse um, is an introduction of a positive pressure out here. If you have a positive pressure occurring in this area or a loss of negative pressure, then the elastic recoil will make the lungs collapse. Oops. If we introduce a positive pressure into that pleural cavity, we call that a pneumothorax, air trapped in the pleural cavity. And that's most commonly from a wound or penetrating trauma through the chest wall. It can also be treated by a punctured hole in a bronchial, where the air is actually leaking from the bronchial into the pleural cavity, as you might have happen in something like a, like a tumor or a congenital defect. So m ventilation is brought or broken down into two processes, inspiration and expiration. And I think I mentioned last time that I prefer the terms inhalation and exhalation. 
you know, inspiration can mean having a great idea, and expiration means to die. So I kind of like inhalation and exhalation better. But these terms are commonly used also. So it's a mechanical process where we change the volume through muscular action. That changes the pressure. And then air flows in or out according to its pressure gradient. All right, let's talk about the muscles involved in this. So here we have a diagram of a rib cage, and the major muscles involved in breathing are the diaphragm, the only muscle that is absolutely required for normal, what we call quiet breathing. Then between the ribs, we have the internal intercostal muscles and the external intercostal muscles. And we also have muscles not pictured here. We have the uh, scaling muscles that come from the superior ribs up to the cervical vertebrae. Um, we have the pectoralis major and minor, which can help elevate the ribs as well. And the rectus abdominis has a role to play too, which connects to the inferior um, costal margin down here and goes down to the pubic symphysis. And we'll talk about the roles of those muscles in a minute. So as I mentioned, the only muscle that's absolutely required for breathing is the diaphragm. So what happens when the diaphragm relaxes? Well, when you relax the diaphragm, it actually uh, springs up towards the, the heart. So a relaxed diaphragm is very dome-shaped. It comes way up like this. And when the diaphragm contracts, it goes down. All right, so let's think about this and how it relates to Boyle's Law. The diaphragm relaxes. It goes up. What does that do to the volume in the pleural cavity? Here's the diaphragm contracted, and then it relaxes and it goes up. Well, that makes the volume in the thorax go down. So your pleural volume goes down. What should that do to the pressure in the alveolar space? Should make it become positive, right? Decrease in volume, increase in pressure, and that's where we go up to plus one. So that's exhalation. When the diaphragm relaxes, we exhale. So exhalation is a passive process. When we breathe in, we contract the diaphragm and it flattens. Well, when the diaphragm flattens, the thorax above expands. So now we've increased the volume, which Boyle's Law will say if you increase the volume, you must decrease the pressure. So now as a result of the diaphragm contracting, we've decreased the pressure and air will flow in, assuming the conducting pathway is open, air will flow in and we're inhaling now. So inhalation is an active process. Now that's for just doing what's called, called tidal breathing or, or quiet breathing, where essentially we're moving about 500 mils or half a liter of air in and out of the lungs with each respiratory cycle. And the diaphragm is the only muscle that needs to be invoked for quiet breathing. The intercostal muscles have a stabilizing role, but not to confuse things, we're just going to leave them out. We're going to say that during quiet breathing, the diaphragm is the only muscle involved. As opposed to what's called uh, labored breathing or forced breathing, both inhalation and exhalation, when we're talking about the forced breathing, are active processes. Right? The diaphragm roll doesn't change, but we use other muscles. So let's go back and think about this again. When I breathe in, okay, here's my diaphragm in its, in its contracted state. Um, the diaphragm flattens, increases the volume, decreases the pressure, air flows in. Well, there are some other ways to increase the volume of the thorax other than just contracting the diaphragm. We can also contract the internal intercostal muscles, and that will actually raise the ribs laterally. And so that will laterally expand the thorax. And again, that expands the thorax, decreases the pressure, and more air flows in. We can also lift the sternum anteriorly. Um, and these are, these are called the, uh, the pump handle for lifting the sternum and the bucket handle for lifting the ribs. And I don't care that you know those names, but that's just it's a common model that's used to describe it. The scalenes and the sternocleidomastoid muscle both can elevate the uh, upper uh, ribs and the uh, sternal body and further expand the thorax and drop the pressure. And so we breathe in more. So just to sum that up, the muscles that are involved in labored inhalation, diaphragm contracting always during inhal inhalation, contraction of the 
we're doing inhalation, right? So contraction of the external intercostal muscles. I think I might have misspoke a minute ago. I'm sorry about that. When we breathe in, we contract the external intercostal muscles, these guys, and that raises the ribs laterally. And then also the scalenes and the SCM, sternocleidomastoid muscle. Those all serve to expand the thorax. The pectoralis minor has a supporting role to play as well. Um, when we breathe out, exhalation, okay, when we breathe out, what we do is flatten the ribs. Um, of course, the diaphragm relaxes when we breathe out, and so it domes up. And that decreases the volume, increases the pressure, so air flows out. Also, we can contract the internal intercostal muscles. So remember, this is during exhalation. If you contract the internal intercostal muscles, that flattens the ribs. And also, we can contract the rectus abdominis, which will pull the rib cage flat up against the abdomen. Uh, so rectus abdominis and internal intercostal muscles and a relaxed diaphragm are what we need for exhalation, labored exhalation. This is a nice graph. I don't put this on the test as a, and ask you any essay questions about it or anything of that nature, but I do want you to know this relationship. So here we're showing the intrapulmonary pressure. Remember, that's the alveolar pressure. And it's oscillating between negative 1 during inhalation and positive 1 during exhalation. Compare that to the trans, well, not the transpulmonary, the intrapul intrapleural pressure, the area around the lungs here in the pleural cavity, always negative. So before we breathe in, it's maybe at a baseline of negative 4. We breathe in, it drops down here to minus 6. And then when we breathe out, it goes back up to minus 4. But it never becomes positive. Remember, if that became positive, that would be called a pneumothorax. And a lung would actually collapse in that condition. And look down here. During this breathing cycle, the amount of, whoops, the amount of air we've moved in uh, during inhalation, we've increased our lung volume up by... Uh, half a liter, 500 mils, and then when we exhale, we send that same 500 mils back out. And it says your typical breathing cycle of about five seconds. Um, a normal respiratory rate is about 15 to 20 breaths per minute. All right, so here we're picking up with um, physical factors that influence pulmonary ventilation, and so it lists here the three of these factors, and I don't make a big deal of these. I, I don't even know if there might be one or two questions about this on on your upcoming test. So your three factors are airway resistance, alveolar surface tension, and lung compliance. If we take a look at this, well, they're based on the surprise, surprise, master flow equation that we looked at before. We know flow in hemodynamics was based on a difference in pressures, and we see that repeated again here, and the opposing force to that is resistance. Um, we've already discussed the significance of the difference in pressures. Um, it, it, with Boyle's law affecting the fact that you know, expand the thorax, drop the pressure, air flows in, shrink the thorax, increase the pressure, air flows out. What we haven't talked about is anything that could affect resistance. And really, the main factor that affects resistance in the respiratory system is simply friction. I think we'll see that here on the next slide. Anyway, it's just air uh, rubbing along the walls of the bronchi. The large bronchi are so large that there's effectively no appreciable resistance. The small bronchioles, uh, there's such a huge surface area of those cross-sectional diameter that, again, the resistance is very little in the, s in the smaller bronchioles. The medium-sized bronchioles are the ones that have the greatest resistance. And, in fact, um, they're the ones that can bronchodilate and bronchoconstrict to adjust airflow. And that's what they're showing here. Your very large bronchioles, not very high resistance. Your medium-sized bronchioles, um, the highest resistance. And by the time you get down to the terminal and respiratory, there's essentially no resistance. We'll talk about things that can change to cause resistance to be abnormally high. Probably the most important clinical, uh, clinical one you'll ever come across is um, uh, asthma attacks, where for one reason or another, be it environmental insult or uh, extreme emotional duress or some something like that, you get way out of control uh, bronchoconstriction and that can actually cause ischemia. Uh, so the way that's treated is to give um, epinephrine and epinephrine is a powerful bronchodilator. It stimulates sympathetic stimulation of the bronchioles which makes them dilate. 
another factor that affects um, ventilation is this concept of surface tension within the lungs themselves we know down at the level oh, I guess I don't have a picture of it I talked about this before when we have the alveoli those little those little sacs the inside surface of the epithelium the type 1 pneumocytes which are the squamous pneumocytes th that's a, um, a watery membrane it has to be watery it has to be moist in order to have gas exchange because the gases will only diffuse through the respiratory membrane if it's wet so it has to remain wet but the fact that it's wet means that there's a surface tension and always tends to make it want to collapse and so we secrete this lipoprotein complex called surfactin from the type 2 pneumocytes uh, onto the surface of those alveoli and it reduces the surface tension and allows them to spring open if you don't have enough surfactant, like would be in the case of a premature baby, say uh, pre-32, 34 weeks, uh, they won't have enough surfactant being produced and they'll actually have respiratory distress syndrome, which is where they don't produce enough surfactant and every time they exhale uh, the lungs actually collapse and they have a lot of respiratory difficulties. So that's infant respiratory distress syndrome. The way that's treated is you give corticosteroids, which actually stimulate and augment the production of um, surfactant in the lungs. Another factor that will affect resistance to airflow is the compliancy of the lungs. Um, compliance means, just like it did in vessels, these which they stretch. Uh, the lung tissue is fairly light and compliant. It's easy to stretch. It has some elastic tissue in it that gives it some elastic recoil. So there's always a balance between making the lungs easy to inflate, extensible, and that would be compliant in this case, and a little bit of recoil once they're hyperinflated, uh, which contributes to the negative uh, intrapleural pressure and helps keep them inflated all the time. As we age, the lungs become a little more fibrotic, and that will reduce that elastic nature of, of the lungs and make it make them less compliant, so it makes it harder to breathe, harder to expand them. Surfactant plays a major role here. Without the surfactant, then the lungs have a tendency to collapse, and so they become less elastic. And anything that scars the lungs, so usually this is environmental um, uh, insult, things like cigarette smoking or hay chaff or coal tar, or things that are breathed in uh, from your environment. Even extremes of temperature can contribute to that. Essentially, you get inflammation in the lungs, and that's followed by uh, a growth of uh, fibrotic tissue over time called pulmonary fibrosis. All right, that's the end of these slides. Now I'll open up um, part B. I'll just hang loose a second. Well, here we have an equation that looks very similar to our flow equation from hemodynamics. In fact, it's the same equation. Flow equals a difference in pressure divided by resistance. So we know to get air to flow in and out of the lungs, we change the pressure gradients. That's no surprise. That should make perfect sense to us now. And we talked about the mechanism by which we do that. Resistance along the conducting zone is fairly low in the respiratory system. Um, and we'll talk about diseases that occur when resistance changes and causes an issue. All right, here we are in part B now. So this first part deals with some concepts that are more applicable to, to lab, really. It talks about the amounts of air that we ventilate in and out of the lungs, and so that's broken down in this chart. Let me show you a, a different graph. This is one I like better. Okay. Your total lung capacity is the total amount of air that can be in the alveolar spaces of the lungs. That's your total lung capacity. Now, don't mistake that with the amount of air that you can move in and out of the lungs, because if you recall when we talked about cardiac function, you could never pump the heart dry. You never had the ventricles completely empty. Uh, even when we did expel blood. And in a similar manner, when we breathe out, we don't get rid of all of the air that's in the lungs. There's always some volume left in the lungs, and in this case, it's quite significant. That would be considered the residual volume down here. So this is the amount of air that we can never get out of the lungs, called a residual volume. The total lung capacity for uh, an adult male is about six liters. So five and a half to six liters is a pretty normal total lung capacity. Of that, a little over 20% or so, is a residual volume. 
That's the volume we can never get out. Which means the difference between your, your total lung capacity and your residual volume must be an amount of air represented here in kind of the blue that can be moved in and out. Now that total amount of air here, this is an important term. This box would represent the total volume of air that we could possibly move in and out of the lungs with every respiratory cycle. Well, that's a pretty staggeringly large number, almost 5 liters, 4.8 liters or 4,800 milliliters. That's called your vital capacity. That's the amount of air you could actually move out of the lungs. Now, in order to do that, you'd have to have taken your maximal inhalation and blow out maximally, so you have your maximal exhalation. All right, so let's take a look at what this is telling us here. This is a type of tracing that a machine called a spirometer will do, and we have a spirometer, which maybe we'll try to hook up and see if we can get to do this. So if you're doing your tidal breathing, it would just be going back and forth like this, meaning that we'd breathe in and we'd take in 500 mils. We'd breathe out and that 500 mils would go out. And we'd breathe in and go up to 500 mils and we'd breathe out and it'd go down. Okay, it doesn't go down to zero because remember, we always have some air left in the lungs. But that would be a tracing for your tidal volume. All right, and a typical tidal volume is 500 mils, and this is what we move in quiet breathing, 500 mils. Do you remember the only muscle involved in quiet breathing? Think about it. The only muscle you absolutely have to have to do quiet breathing, and that would be the, the diaphragm. So when we breathe out, the diaphragm relaxes, and we, uh, well, when we breathe in, the diaphragm contracts, and we bring in that air, and then when the diaphragm relaxes, it becomes dome-shaped and goes up, and we breathe out, and it goes down. So breathe in, we contract, breathe out, it relaxes, and that's how we get our tidal volume. All right, now let's say we want to uh, breathe in as much as we possibly can. All right, so after we've had our uh, tidal volume um, brought in, then we take in as big a breath as possible. <sighs> well, that represents this peak here. <clears throat> you see, that's quite large. That's your inspiratory reserve volume, your I-S-V, inspiratory reserve, I'm sorry, I-R-V, I-R-V, I don't know what I was thinking. Inspiratory reserve volume, your I-R-V, that's a little over three liters, a little over three liters. So nearly half your lung volume can be your inspiratory reserve volume. So think, I'm about to swim underwater as far as I can, that deep breath that I just took, that would be a pretty good representation of your inspiratory reserve volume. You've really stretched the lungs to their upper limit here. All right, now you breathe that out. Okay, now you've ex exhaled your inspiratory reserve volume, you're back to your tidal volume. Now let's say you breathe out your tidal volume, just a normal exhalation. Well, you know you can force out some more air beyond that. The air that you can force out beyond a normal tidal exhalation is called your expiratory reserve volume, or your E. V, okay, expiratory reserve volume, and this is a little over a liter, 1,200 given in this book, okay. So that's how much you could breathe out. That's a maximal exhalation. You cannot get rid of the residual volume. You can't breathe that out. This is as much as you could push out. So think you're trying to blow up a balloon here, and you're <sighs> blowing as much as you can until you can't blow anymore. Um, that's your expiratory reserve volume. Now, if you take your tidal volume and your inspiratory reserve volume and your your inspiratory reserve volume and your expiratory reserve volume and you put those three together right, you get your IRV and your tidal volume and your expiratory reserve volume and you add those together and you get your tidal volume uh, <laughs> I didn't mean tidal volume you get your vital capacity so IRV plus tidal volume plus ERV equals your vital capacity. And this is going to be important to understand when I have you calculate this in lab, because what you can do in lab, if you imagine this, is you take a little respirometer, and we have handheld ones we can do this on. Um, you take a respirometer, and you hold it like this in front of you, and you make sure your fingers aren't covering the air holes, and it's flat, and you've calibrated the dial so that it reads zero. Right? And what you can do is you breathe out well, you take in as large a breath as you can, and you put it in your mouth, and you blow, 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 blow as long as you can, and have somebody yell at you and say, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, until you're just about to pass out, then you're done. Then, you know, you stop, and you look at it. And what you recorded there, that would be your vital capacity. 
you took in as big a breath as possible, so you're up here, and then you breathe out as much as you can. So you breathe out your inspiratory reserve, your tidal volume, and your expiratory reserve. And that was your, um, your vital capacity that you'll be able to record. All right, so I've done this several times, and I usually manage to get somewhere around five and a half to six liters. I have a pretty good, pretty good lung volume there. Um, now what you can do is you go and you, you you equilibrate back to a tidal volume, so you go back to just normal breathing. And then now here's the trick: you have to kind of imagine when you're done breathing out with a normal tidal breath. Okay, so you kind of try to sit here and not think about breathing, because as soon as you start thinking about it, you take a conscious approach to regulating with something that should be subconscious. All right, so you kind of just sit and wait till you take a normal exhalation, and then you breathe out as much as you can. And so you put the spirometer in your mouth, you breathe out as much as you can. So you just measure this. Okay, so that's going to allow you to get your expiratory reserve. Okay, now you know you can just estimate that your tidal volume, which our handheld spirometers don't do a very good job of reading the tidal volume, so you can just estimate the tidal volume to be 500, which is pretty typical. All right, so let's say I tested my vital capacity and I got six liters. And then I did my expiratory reserve and I got, uh, let's say I got 1.5 liters. And I assume that my tidal volume is 0.5 liters. Well, then what I can solve for is the one that we really can't measure, and that's the inspiratory reserve volume. So this is pretty representative of what I've done before. If I do this, then I solve that, and my IRV, mine would be 6 liters minus 2 liters, would be about 4 liters. And I might ask you to run through a calculation like that on the lab test. Um, so I expect you to know how to use that spirometer and do these calculations that I just did for you right there. Um, like that, okay? And have fun with this. This is, this is a fun thing to do in lab. And um, we can talk about some of the conditions that will alter these. So these values here, I wouldn't have you memorize these strictly because they're going to be different from person to person. Um, but the generalities you should know. I would like you to know that your tidal volume is typically 500 mils. Right? Your inspiratory volume is usually much larger than your expiratory reserve volume. Right? And that there's always a residual volume that's around 12 or maybe 1100 mils. Uh, a little smaller for a female than for a male. Right? Now, like I mentioned, there's some air in the lungs that you can never ventilate. All right. Um, that's a residual volume. Well, part of the residual volume is what we call dead space. Um, if you think about it, the conducting zone is full of air, and the conducting zone has no alveoli associated with it. So the entire conducting zone would be what we call anatomical. Uh, where's my pointer? Anatomical dead space. Y you can't have any gas exchange there. So the entire conducting zone would represent part of your residual volume. There's air in there, and it contributes to the volume but it's useless. It's not doing anything. Right. You can have alve alve ah, alveolar dead space. Well, there are times when certain alveoli are not open, maybe because of lung damage or decreased surfactant production, something of that nature. That would be uh, alveolar, non-functional alveolar dead space. And you add those two up and you've got your, your total dead space. This, the alveolar dead space, ordinarily should be quite small. So as I mentioned, we use a spirometer to test these different volumes, and that's what you did in lab, where you used your little handheld spirometer. There are two types of conditions that the spirometry can be used to test for. We have what's called obstructive pulmonary disease, and we have restrictive disorders. Um, most of us are familiar with uh, obstructive pulmonary uh, um, diseases. Obstructive pulmonary diseases are things like bronchitis. Where's my pointer? lost it now. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, uh, bronchitis and asthma would fall under this obstructive concept. This is where we get increased airway resistance. And so uh, what you wind up having is your lungs tend to expand to try to accommodate 
for that decreased flow. And so it talks about here your total lung capacity may actually increase, um, but your res residual volume, the air trapped in the lungs, also goes up. So the functional reserve capacity, which is what FRC is here, functional reserve capacity, actually goes down. It's a little counterintuitive. Even though your total lung capacity goes up, the lungs are trying to get bigger to compensate for this issue, we're having a hard time ventilating the air in and out. We're having a hard time moving it. So the residual volume actually increases, and that actually takes away from your functional reserve capacity, the amount of air you can actually move. Restrictive disorders, uh, these tend to be conditions that um, cause the lung to lose their compliancy. So the chief culprit here would be pulmonary fibrosis. Since it's harder to expand the lungs, your vital capacity goes down. And likewise, you get your functional reserve capacity goes down as well. Okay, nothing I'm going to talk about the pulmonary function test. I'm not going to hold you responsible for anything with that. Should know something about ventilation terms, though. The uh, minute ventilation, that's very much like cardiac output. It's simply the amount of air you move in and out of the lungs every minute. So much like cardiac output with stroke volume times heart rate, minute volume is simply respiratory rate times your um, vital capacity. Right. Whatever you're moving in and out of the lungs. So if we think about that, if you took, I'm not sure what numbers they use, let's see what we get, if you took 20 breaths per minute, 20 breaths per minute, and you multiplied that by, if you're at uh, at rest, then it wouldn't be the vital capacity, but it would be the tidal volume, which you'd multiply this by. And our tidal volume, we know, is 500 mils. All right, and so what would we get there? We get 2 times 5 is 10, and we'll put in our three zeros there. Okay, and we would get... Um, 10 liters for our minute volume. And so their number here is probably based on a respiratory rate closer to maybe 10 to 12 breaths per minute. We, yeah, we did that at 10. If we did that at 10 breaths per minute, we'd have 5,000. So they're probably doing about 12 breaths per minute, right. if you follow my logic there. So you just take however much air you're moving. So if you're at rest, that's the tidal volume. If you're breathing maximally, that's your vital capacity, which Believe me, if you tried to breathe in your vital capacity again and again and again, you'd get exhausted. That's very hard to do. Um, so this is a typical way of calculating your minute volume. Again, I'm not going to have you worry about calculating alveolar ventilation rates either, so we can skip this slide. Here it's giving you some respiratory rates you should be familiar with. So slow, deep breathing, there's 10 breaths per minute, kind of normal rate in breath. There's 20 breaths per minute. And then rapid, shallow breathing. Rapid breathing, that'd be 40 breaths per minute. That'd be, that'd be hyperventilation at that point. Well, look here. Without going into how it's calculated, effective ventilation is a gauge of how much air you're moving in and out. Well, your slow, deep breathing, that's the most efficient. So this is the logic behind when people tell you to calm down and slow down your breathing when you're having a hard time catching your breath. Because if you can slow it down, that is the most efficient breathing and you will get the best effective ventilation. Um, but that's awfully hard to do when you're in full panic mode and you're breathing in this manner. Okay, nothing I want to tell you about that. All right, let's get to the business end here. What happens for gas exchanges between blood, lungs, and tissues? This is really the meat and potatoes of what I want to talk about next. We know that gas exchange in the lungs is called external respiration. We know gas exchange in the tissue spaces between the systemic capillaries and the tissue spaces is called internal respiration. So both involve physical properties of gases, such as uh, things like um, solubility and diffusion. And... Um, the composition of the alveolar gases is not fixed. Now there are three gases that make up air, uh, room air, right? Three gases. One, two, and three. And I know the slides later have these listed, but let's play a little game here. What's the most prevalent gas that we have in room air? 
right? Did anybody guess? Did he guess oxygen? 